this. All right, I just wanna make sure that everyone can see and hear me. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really, really excited to be able to partner with the Asheville Museum of Science. Um, I've been visiting their facility for years and it's always really wonderful when two science facilities can partner with each other. So for those of you that don't know, my name is Tori Duval, and I am the outreach educator for the Friends of the WNC Nature Center. So I've got our logo right behind me. And I've also got a nice little animal representative right behind me just to get you guys into the animal spirit. So if you've been to the Nature Center before, then you know that we are all about native wildlife. So that's what makes the Nature Center different. That's what makes us special is that all of the animals that live at the Nature Center are native to the Southern Appalachian Mountain region. So all of the animals that call the Nature Center home are animals that call the mountains of North Carolina home. There are critters that live around here in the wild. They're what I like to call our wild neighbors. So that's kind of why we're a little bit different than other zoos that you may have been to before. All of our animals are critters that you could see around here, either now or historically. Sometimes we get questions about like red pandas and things like that, and we'll definitely get to that and why we have red pandas. So I am the outreach educator for the Friends of the Nature Center. Now the Friends of the Nature Center is the nonprofit that helps support the WNC Nature Center. And my job is to be the traveling animal lady. So usually you could see me driving around town in the wild wagon, which is um, the wagon that has all of the animal pictures printed on it that the Nature Center has. And I bring animal education programs to schools and libraries and retirement communities and summer camps and all sorts of other facilities throughout Western North Carolina. So I'm generally bringing animal education programs to individuals and facilities who can't necessarily come to the Nature Center for a lot of different reasons, you know, whether budgetary reasons or just travel restrictions or physical distance and things like that. So we try to make sure that we can bring animal education programs to folks who can't necessarily visit us at the Nature Center. So that's usually what I'm doing. Um, but as a lot of you know right now, the Nature Center is closed to the public. We are still there and taking care of our critters. Don't worry about that. But while we're closed, we have been offering distance learning programs. So instead of bringing the Nature Center to a schoolroom, I am bringing the Nature Center right to your living room. And I'm doing it from my own home. So I am in a spare bedroom right now with this lovely backdrop behind me. Um, so I'm working from home just like you guys are working from home and staying at home. And, it's really amazing that I'm still able to bring these animal education programs to all of the people in Western North Carolina, because that really is what I love to do. So what we're going to do today, we've got a really special program where we're going to do something called conversations with a keeper. So not only am I an educator, not only do I travel around and bring animal programs to different schools, the education team at the Nature Center is responsible for caring for all of the animals that we have in our collection. So if we teach with an animal, we also take care of that animal. So that means that I help take care of owls and hawks and snakes and turtles and frogs and toads and millipedes and possums and skunks and all sorts of critters that either are with our education department now or used to be with our education department. I've got experience caring for all of those animals. I also have experience working with the other keepers. So even though I am not the person that takes care of the black bears, I still know a lot about the black bears because I am very, very lucky and I get to work closely with the individuals who do take care of all the other animals that live at the Nature Center. So I'm gonna be here to answer all of your animal questions. Um, if you ask me questions about animals that don't live in the mountains of North Carolina, I'm gonna do my best to answer them. 
But I will tell you that my area of expertise definitely lies within the Southern Appalachian Mountain region and within the, the types of animals that we have at the Nature Center. So I'll do my best to answer any animal questions that you have. But if you ask me questions about sea turtles, I don't know as much about sea turtles as I do about box turtles. I can always look it up and find out the answer for you, but I may not know it off the top of my head. So we did have some folks who sent in questions ahead of time. So please feel free at any time to add questions to the chat box. So I would love to be able to read the questions that you guys have as you're watching live. But until questions start popping up, I am going to answer some of the questions that I recorded from some emails that we had earlier in the week. So one of the first questions that we had was about turtles, which is a really great place to start because turtles are awesome. And we had a question, do turtles have blood circulating through their shells? Which was a very specific question and I really enjoyed it, that it was very, very scientific, very specific question. Do turtles have blood circulating through their shells? And the answer is they don't. So turtles, they have shells. And in just a second, I can actually go and grab a turtle shell. I've got one across the room um, that I can show you guys. I've got lots of different biofacts. So turtles have shells and their bodies are inside of those shells. They're attached to those shells. So they have their backbone that runs down the back of their shell. And that's what their body is connected to but they don't have blood inside of their shells. So all of their blood stays inside the soft, squishy parts of their body, just like that's where our blood is. Um, and then their shell has an outer protective coating that is made of keratin, which is the same stuff that our fingernails are made of. So our fingernails are made of keratin, our hair is actually made of keratin as well. And the really nice protective covering over a turtle shell that gives it whatever color the turtle happens to be is made of keratin. So I always like to tell people you can think of turtles as having one big bone that's covering their body, that shell, that's covered in one big fingernail or a bunch of littler fingernails. So that was a really, really fun question. I love talking about turtles. Turtle talk is always good. So I'm gonna read another question that we had that was submitted earlier this week. But remember, please feel free to add questions into the chat box as well. All right, let's see. Our next question is a lot bigger of a question and it is, where do you get your animals? And that is a huge question. And I really appreciate it when people ask that question because it's something that I always ask as well. So when I visit other zoos or other aquariums, other animal facilities, I always like to know where are they getting their animals and are they getting them from a reliable source. So we definitely don't wanna go somewhere and support a place that's just pulling animals out of the wild for no reason and is you know, having them live under human care. So all of the animals that live at the Nature Center have their own story. A lot of the animals that live at the Nature Center were injured in the wild. So just like this owl right here behind me on the wall, this is Junior. He is our Eastern Screech Owl that lives at the Nature Center. He is not this big in real life, he's about Yay, big in real life, but he's big on this picture. Um, so this is Junior, and as you can see, one of Junior's eyes is all blacked out, and then this other eye, this other eye looks a lot more normal. So Junior's actually blind in this particular eye. So he was hit by a car, and that's actually something that happens to a lot of birds of prey. Every single bird that lives at the Nature Center is a car accident victim, so they all have injuries from different interactions with cars. And unfortunately, that's really common because people will throw things out of their car window. So even things like that are biodegradable that we don't think of as litter, like apple cores, banana peels, you know, old French fries that you found in between the seat, that kind of thing. Um, if, you, if you have things like that in your car, we always ask that people hold on to them until you can throw them away or compost them or get rid of them responsibly. Because if you throw things like that out of your car window, you're going to have little animals like mice attracted to the sides of the road. And when you have little animals like mice attracted to the sides of the road, you get your larger animals attracted to the sides of the road, like your owls, who are doing what they do, which is hunting. And that's how so many birds of prey are hit by cars. Excuse me. So that's how we get some of our animals. They have injuries. Um, some of our other critters were actually born in the wild, and then they were taken out of the wild and kept as a pet, which for the most part is illegal, especially in North Carolina. North Carolina has pretty strict wildlife laws when it 
comes to taking things out of the wild and, and keeping them under human care. So some of the critters at the Nature Center, like our female otter named Olive, I'm sure a lot of you guys know Olive, um, our otters are rather famous. Olive was taken out of the wild when she was still a little baby and she was kept as a pet for a few weeks until the people who took her realized, oh, maybe this isn't such a great pet because this is a wild animal and it has very sharp teeth and it can bite and it is just a hungry little carnivore that's living in my backyard and it is supposed to be a wild animal. It's not supposed to be a pet. But unfortunately at that point when an animal has been out of the wild and been around humans and has associated humans with food and not with danger or with something that they need to stay away from, we can't release that animal back into the wild because they're a danger to themselves as well as to us. So that's what we call humanized or imprinted. So some of our animals have been imprinted upon by other people and were not able to be released back into the wild. And then some of the animals that live at the nature center were just born in other zoo facilities. And so they've never learned how to care for themselves in the wild. They wouldn't know how to hunt for themselves, how to find food, how to find shelter, how to raise their own babies even sometimes. So th those are some of the different reasons. There's definitely not just one reason why we have the animals that we have at the Nature Center. If anyone has any questions about specific animals, I would love to hear them. So if you're wondering how we got a certain animal that lives at the Nature Center, please feel free to put that in the, in the comments so I can read them. I haven't had any comments pop up just yet. Um, so please feel free to add some little questions for me. I would love to answer those questions as we go along. Otherwise, this is going to be a very short session. But I do have a few more questions that I collected um, with the emails that we got this week before we started our live session. So I'll pull up another one of those guys. All right. Oh, this is a fun one. So... One of the questions that I got asked actually in a class that I was teaching this morning was, what is the smallest animal at the nature center? And that's a difficult question um, because we have a lot of little insects. So we do have like we have um, ants at the nature center and we have millipedes and of course they're pretty small. And of course we have crickets and mealworms and things like that. But leaving out the crickets and the mealworms and the ants, the insects, the smallest animal that we have at the nature center is the spring peeper. So spring peepers are a type of frog and they're only about that big. They're quite small and that's full grown adult. So we have spring peepers at the nature center and they are some of the smallest animals that live at the nature center. But just because they're small does not mean that they don't make a very loud sound. So spring peepers, they're some of the first frogs that you hear. Um, so you can actually hear spring peepers around here as early as February. That's when I started hearing them calling this year was the beginning of February. I started hearing peeping and you usually hear it around dusk. So just as the sun is getting ready to set and right after the sun sets and you'll hear lots of high pitch beep, 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 and just over and over and over again. Sometimes people don't associate peeping with frogs because they usually think ribbit. But frogs make a lot of different types of noises, including ribbits, but lots of peeping, lots of croaking, lots of chirping. And that is definitely a very small animal that contributes a lot of sound to the wild and to the nature center. All right, let's see. Another question we had. Ooh, this is very relevant to this time of year. What do I do if I see a black bear in my yard? And that's a really important question to ask. Excuse me, guys. So Western North Carolina is known for having a lot of black bears, like a lot of black bears. It's one of the things we're famous for. And generally, it is not uncommon for people to have black bears wandering through their yards or wandering like through schoolyards. We definitely have black bears that sometimes um, volunteer <laughs> to visit the nature center. So we have had black bears on our paths and on our wood trail, our trillium trail before. And the best thing to do with a black bear when you see one in the wild is to just leave it alone. So if you're like out hiking somewhere, if you're somewhere in a large space where there's plenty of room between you and the black bear, just let that black bear do its thing. Um, it's not messing with you. So it's not good that you mess with that bear. Black bears, we're pretty lucky. Um, black bears are not generally aggressive animals. They're pretty 
easily spooked, so a loud noise will scare them away, um, and they really don't have a lot of interest in messing with us. But the one time that they can be a little bit scary is if you get it between a mom and her babies, because of course that's how all moms are. They want to protect their babies. So you always just want to make sure that if you see a black bear in the wild, you're letting it, letting it be, letting it do its thing. If there's a black bear in your neighborhood, then that black bear is most likely there because it is looking for food. So black bears have an amazing sense of smell. So they can smell food up to 10 miles away, which is pretty incredible. And what they consider food and what we consider food are two very different things. So <laughs> black bears definitely around here, they're known for getting into people's trash. So if you've got some good smelling trash, if you threw away some food scraps um, that have a strong scent to them, then a black bear could definitely smell that and uh, consider that just a really nice free buffet. So, you know, going to a neighborhood that has all of its garbage cans out with lots of old food in it is sort of like going to Golden Corral for a black bear. Um, and they also have a really good memory for food. So once they've associated that general neighborhood with food, they're going to come back and try to find more. So there's a couple things that you can do to help prevent that. So we always recommend that people wait as long as they can to put their trash cans out. So not putting them out the night before, but putting them out the morning of trash collection so that bears don't come in the middle of the night to get into your garbage cans. Um, also, if you are able to get bear-proof trash cans, that's always a really wonderful idea um, so that the bear, they're, they're gonna work a little bit to find food, but they're not gonna sit there for an hour and try to break open your trash can. Um, they're a little lazier than that, frankly. <laughs> so if, if they come to your trash can and it's a bear-proof trash can and they're having to work really hard to get into it, they're just going to move on. They're not going to worry about trying to, to um, spend 15, 20 minutes breaking into a trash can. So that's one really good way to prevent it um, is bear-proof trash cans, not putting your trash out too early, and also not leaving out other pet food. So like cat food, if you've got outdoor cats, not leaving the cat food out overnight. That's good not only to prevent bears from coming, but all sorts of other critters that are wonderful to have around, not too close, but that don't need our help finding food. So animals like possums, I always hear about possums that visit people's porches at night and uh, they eat the, the dry cat food that the, that the person has left out for their cat. And possums are incredible animals. Uh, people who are friends with me know that I am obsessed with possums. They are definitely <laughs> on my mind a lot. I love possums. And they're really wonderful animals to have around in the wild, but they don't need our help finding food. Possums are very good at finding food on their own. They don't need our cat food. Uh, they can eat a big variety of other things. Possums can eat venomous snakes, so they can eat rattlesnakes and copperheads. They're immune to that snake venom. They can eat dead animals. They can eat a lot of things that other animals can't eat because they're immune to so many diseases. Possums eat ticks, so a single possum can eat like over 3,000 ticks throughout the summer. So possums are not picky. Um, they eat a big variety of things, and they can definitely find their food on their own without our help, and bears are the same way. So bears don't need our trash, um, but they will definitely take advantage of an easy meal. So some tips that you guys can, that you guys can use for um, preventing bears from visiting your neighborhood, like not leaving your trash out longer than you have to, getting those bear-proof trash cans. And then if you do have a bear visiting your neighborhood, just leaving it be, letting it do its thing, and um, it will move on hopefully soon. If you guys ever have issues with bears, so if there's ever like a concern about safety regarding black bears, then we always recommend that you call the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. And they do head a really wonderful project called BearWise, which has even more information about how to be bear safe in this area more than I could remember. All right, let's see here. For those of you just joining us, please feel free to add questions in the comments. I'm actually going to leave a comment um, right here so that we have some audience participation. I haven't had anything pop up in the comments just yet, so please feel free to ask questions to leave comments. Um, so that we can keep this going. We definitely want the program to last as long as possible. I've still got a few more questions, a few more animal questions on my list. So let's see, our next animal question. Ooh. So this one was red panda specific. Um, and we do have red pandas at the nature center. And 
over the past you know, year, we've had them since February of 2019. So we've had them a little over a year and we've gotten a lot of the same question of why do you have red pandas at the nature center? Because we have native animals at the nature center. So we have red pandas at the nature center because red pandas were historically, their ancestor was historically native to this area. And that was before the last ice age. So they are the first of our prehistoric Appalachian animals, which I think is really, really exciting. So the ancestor of the red panda, which was called the Bristol's panda, is very similar to the red panda, just a little bit larger than the present day red panda. It was native to this area, and that's why we have the present day red panda living with us. Um, it's also an endangered species, so we are part of the species survival program for that animal. So that's a really important thing that we do. We, we are a part of several different species survival programs at the Nature Center, and the red panda is one of them. So our red pandas, their names are Leafa and Phoenix. Leafa is the female, and Leafa has actually had eight babies already. So she has had eight babies, four with a different male, and then four with the male that she lives with now, whose name is Phoenix. And the question that I had was, how old are the red pandas? So our red pandas were both born in June and Leafa was born in 2009. So this year, this June, she'll be turning 11 years old. And then Phoenix was also, like I said, born in June. They were actually only born two days apart, June 11th and June 13th. Phoenix was born in 2011. So this June on June 13th, he will be nine years old. So Leaf is a little bit older than Phoenix. She's also, because she's had so many babies, like I said, she has had eight babies, which means that she's contributed a lot to the gene pool. When you have an endangered species, you have to be really careful about how many um, animals come from the same mother because you want as much difference, you want as much um, variety, that's the word, you want as much variety in the DNA as possible. So because Leafa has already had eight babies, she's contributed quite a bit to the population, it's unlikely that she will be having babies again in the future. The other reason for that is because she is kind of getting a little bit too old for that. So Leaf has sort of moved past that stage in her life. But we're hoping that we'll have those two with us for a very long time to come. So that's why we have red pandas at the Nature Center. That's how old they are. Another question that we had, and this is a question that I got um, this morning from one of the second grade classes that I was teaching was what is the strongest animal at the nature center? And that's a really difficult question to answer because it kind of depends on what sort of strength you're talking about. So I, I gave a couple different answers. Um, one of the answers that I thought of, well, if you're thinking about jaw strength, um, any of the carnivores, of course, like the cougar has incredible jaw strength, the types of things that they can crunch through and the wolves as well. So they definitely have very, very strong jaws. But if you think about our black bears, you know, black bears are, are very, very strong and they can lift heavy things and, and, and crush trash cans and things like that. So if we're thinking about like um, upper body strength, I think our black bears would definitely be up there as well. So it depends on the individual animal, but there's definitely a lot of different strengths that we could talk about. And one of the ones that I always like to bring up is, um, is the ability to jump. So it takes a lot of muscle strength to be able to jump, especially from a sitting position if you're not getting a running start. And one of our best jumpers at the Nature Center is our cougar. So our cougar's name is Mitchell. Um, he's also known as a mountain lion or a catamount or a panther or a painter. Um, they have a lot of different nicknames. It's all the same animal. Uh, <laughs> they're the biggest of the small cat family. So our cougar Mitchell when they jump, when cougars jump, they jump from a sitting position. They don't have to get a running start. And just from that sitting position, they can jump the length of a school bus, which is pretty amazing. And if you visited the Nature Center over the summer before, we actually have um, a really fun interactive docent station that we sometimes set up where we've got different biofacts, so like skulls and fur and things like that from cougars, from bobcats, from our different felines. And we have an activity where you can see how far you can jump. Um, so far, nobody has jumped as far as, as Mitchell can jump or come anywhere close. That would be pretty incredible. 
All right, let's see what other questions we have. So this one, it wasn't specifically about nature center animals, um, which is fine. These questions do not have to be about nature center animals or even about an animal that lives here in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. It was a question about fish. So the question was, how do bioluminescent fish glow? And bioluminescent fish are just fish that glow. Bioluminescent means that you, you light up. So just like a firefly, that's what I always think of because we do have an animal around here that's bioluminescent and that's the firefly. So that is all a chemical reaction. So there's a couple different chemicals that those animals have in their bodies, but what's really important, the catalyst for that reaction, so what's going to cause that reaction, that chemical reaction to happen, what's going to cause that animal to light up is oxygen. So it's a couple different chemicals that they may have in their bodies that mix with oxygen that cause them to glow. So the firefly is the one that we always think of. And if you've ever been out at night to catch fireflies, if you pay really close attention to a single firefly, you may notice that there is a pattern to the way that they light up. Um, so they do communicate with different patterns. And sometimes fireflies <laughs> will um, mimic other firefly patterns to try to attract females and things like that, which is pretty interesting. So they can mimic other patterns from other fireflies, um, but they do use that to communicate. So the question was about bioluminescent fish and bioluminescent fish, it's the same idea. So they have chemicals inside of their body and there is a reaction. The catalyst for that reaction is oxygen. And when oxygen mixes with those chemicals, it causes them to glow. And there's a few different reasons why they might glow down in the ocean. Um, but what I think is really interesting is that it's estimated that up to 90% of ocean life actually has the ability to be bioluminescent. So it's a really common thing in the ocean, the ability to glow, the ability to light up. And it's not always their whole bodies. If you think of like angler fish and, you know, other critters that have like one little light that glows to attract animals, to attract prey, and that's how they catch their food. So there's a lot of different reason, reasons why they might glow, why they might be bioluminescent, but the vast majority of ocean animals have the ability to light up. All right, let's see. For those of you just joining us, please feel free to put questions in the comment box below. I haven't seen any questions pop up yet. I've got a few more on my list that were sent in ahead of time. I'm hoping that there's not questions that are popping up that I'm just not able to see. Um, so I'm going to keep my phone near me just in case there are and see if our Amos person. Um, all right. Oh, wonderful. She's sending me all the questions. Okay. That makes way more sense. I was kind of surprised that nobody was asking questions. All right. So I've got on my phone pulled up here um, some questions that are showing up in the comment box. So thank you guys for being patient with me because none of these were showing up. So I'm really glad that people are watching and asking questions. All right, so forgive me as I'm looking down at my phone. All right, oh, I love that Steve said that you love to hear the peepers in the spring. It is absolutely always a sign that spring is coming. It's the first thing you're gonna hear um, in February. It's wonderful. So we had a question that says, what level of education do you have to have to work at the Nature Center? I love this question because there is not just one right answer. So to be an educator at the Nature Center, there's a lot of different paths that you can take. Um, and to work with the animals at the Nature Center, there's a lot of different paths that you can take. So my journey was I went to UNC Asheville for environmental science. So that's what I majored in. And while I was there, I actually interned at the Nature Center in the animal department. So I was doing just animal care, which was really, really fun for me. I loved it. And some of the folks that I worked with that I was an intern under are still there today, which I think is pretty cool. So that's what I did when I was in school and I graduated and I said, you know, I really enjoyed the animal care. That was super fun, but it's not everything that I want to do. So I ended up getting an internship at the Cradle of Forestry in Pisgah National Forest and I did education. So I did environmental education, but there was no animal component to it. And I was like, oh, you know, I really like this too. This is super fun. If only there were a way to combine the two things. And there is, um, it is called being an educator at the Nature Center. So there was an AmeriCorps position that opened up at the WNC Nature Center in 2016 that I very luckily um, got. 
And we were able to turn that outreach position into a full-time paid position, and I've been there ever since. So I've been at the Nature Center since 2016, and my personal path was majoring in environmental science and doing all these internships. When you're, If you're interested in environmental education, internships are a big, big part of it. Um, if you're interested in more of the animal care side of things, you can go and get your four-year degree in animal science. You can get it in biology, um, but you can also get a technical degree um, to be a zookeeper. So if you were to ask any of the other staff members at the Nature Center what their story was and how they ended up where they are, everyone has a different answer. And that's what's really cool about our field is that there's not just one right way to get there. There's a lot of different ways to get there. All right, let's see here. Our next question comes from Kate. We have white-tailed deer come through our backyard a lot. Oh my gosh, me too. <laughs> you can't keep them away even if you want to. What is their usual range and how far do they go to forage for food? Oh, that's a great question. So deer are persistent. <laughs> so they can definitely travel miles and miles to find the food that they want. Um, and if they're coming to your backyard regularly, obviously you've got some good stuff going on in there. Deer can eat over 600 species of plants. So that's a really cool animal to have around, unless of course you have a garden and they're getting into your garden, which I understand they're bad for that. Groundhogs are bad for that too. Um, but something that deer do a really wonderful service that they provide as they're visiting all of these yards is that they eat things like poison ivy. So deer can eat a lot of invasive species and they can eat poison ivy as well and things that you maybe don't want too much of hanging around in your yard, especially if you spend a lot of time in your yard. All right, let's see. Oh, this is a good one. So Dan asked, if a raptor has a broken wing, what's the likelihood that it can be eventually re-released? So that's a very complicated question and it really does depend on the individual bird and what happened to that wing. So the Nature Center doesn't take in rehabbed animals anymore, but we did used to. Um, and we actually just sort of in the past few years stopped doing that because a wonderful facility called Appalachian Wildlife Refuge opened up. Um, hi, AppWild. <laughs> so if you ever do find an injured animal, please, if you call us, we'll direct you to them, but you can always call them directly. You can contact them, Appalachian Wildlife Refuge, and they can tell you exactly what to do. So if we did have a bird with an injured wing, those are probably the people that we would bring it to in this area. And it really depends on how well that bird is going to heal. So the best case scenario is that that bird can make a full recovery and they've got full use of their, of their wings and they're able to be released back into the wild. It could be a few months, it could be a few years. It really depends on the bird and how bad the injury is. Um, with all of the birds that live at the nature center, a lot of them do have wing injuries, but because they were permanent injuries and they weren't able to recover from those injuries, they're never going to be able to be released to the wild. So it really does depend on the individual bird, but that is always the best case scenario and the scenario that everyone hopes for in the rehab world is that they're able to be released into the wild. That was a great question. Oh, I love that Steve O'Neill said opossums are awesome. Opossums are awesome. So I was talking about possums a few minutes ago and I, I, I really have like an obsession with opossums. Um, and they just do so much for us. They're like the unsung heroes. They're nature's little cleanup crew. They do so many things that we don't know that they're doing. And if we did not have them around, it would be a very different landscape. Absolutely. All right. So Amos, hi Amos. So Amos asked us a question. Do you ever deal with rabies? Ooh, we got three different questions here. Okay, so the first question, do you ever deal with rabies? Yes. So some of the animals that live at the nature center are what we call rabies vector species. And that means that they are more likely to pass rabies along to a human, to pass rabies along. So there are five rabies vector species according to the state of North Carolina. So every state that you go to has different rabies regulations. Um, some of them have certain, <clears throat> excuse me, animals classified that other states do not. So in the state of North Carolina, the rabies vector species are bats, coyotes, foxes, skunks, and raccoons. So those are the five that live in the state of North Carolina. And we currently have four of the five. We don't have bats, but we do have foxes. We have one skunk. We have one raccoon and we have coyotes. 
So in order to work with those animals, um, it is required that you have your rabies vaccines. It's also required that they have their rabies vaccines. So all of our mammals are vaccinated for rabies, whether they're considered a vector species or not. And all of our keepers that work with any of those animals are vaccinated for rabies as well. Um, so getting your, your like pre-vaccines is a lot easier than getting a rabies shot once you've already been exposed to the virus. So if you do work with wildlife like that, it is important that you get something like that ahead of time. All right, let's see. I personally got my rabies shot so I could work with um, the skunk because he is one of my all-time favorite critters. Hopefully you guys will get him to see him again soon. Um, his name is Elvis and he lives down in the barn and he is just a wonderful little guy. All right, our next question from Amos, because you guys sent me a few, which is wonderful. What is the cutest animal that you've helped? Oh, the cutest animal, just one? I can't say all of them. There are so many cute animals <laughs> that I worked with at the Nature Center. Um, I would say one of the cutest animals I've ever worked with was Virginia the opossum, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Um, one of the downsides of being an opossum is that you don't have a long lifespan. So even under human care, four years old is very old for opossums. So they just don't live that long. Um, so Virginia the opossum was one of my favorites. She was one of the animals that came to us because she was injured in the wild. Um, so she, when she was very, very young, her mother and all of her little siblings were attacked by a dog, which happens. Dogs go after possums. I get it. Um, and Virginia had some injuries to her face and to her snout, to her nose. So when she would turn sideways, usually possums have like a really elongated snout with lots of teeth. Virginia's was very short. She had like almost a cat-like face. Um, because of that injury, her snout never grew properly. She would get um, colds very easily, so she snuffled a lot. Um, so that was why she stayed with us, because she did not have a good sense of smell. And she definitely wasn't going to be able to care for herself in the wild. But she is, to date, one of the cutest animals I've ever interacted with. All right, and for those of you just joining us, I'm sorry that I keep looking down at my phone. It's only because for some reason the questions aren't popping up on my screen. So I'm having people send them to me from here, which is super, super helpful. And thank you. All right. Ooh. So Steve also asked us, Steve O'Neill, who loves possums, and I think that's great, also wanted to know, does the Nature Center still have a hellbender? We do. So we have a wonderful hellbender. His name is Meatloaf, which just, it doesn't get better than that as a name for a hellbender. Um, and he is an excellent little critter. He still lives in Appalachian Station, which is the building that houses all of our reptiles and our amphibians, as well as some of our insects and our least weasels. So there's a lot of different critters in there, but it's our one big indoor space at the Nature Center. So you can visit Meatloaf there whenever we open back up again. And hellbenders, for those of you that don't know, are a very important salamander species. So they are considered a species of special concern in North Carolina. They're on their way to being endangered, um, but they're really important ones to have around. Salamanders and, and hellbenders especially are what we call an indicator species. Um, and an indicator species is just a species of plant or animal, it can be either one, that indicates the health of an ecosystem. So basically what that means is they're very sensitive to things like pollution. So if you have that animal living in an ecosystem, the chances are good that that's a pretty healthy ecosystem. So if you ever found a hellbender, we do have hellbenders living around here in the wild. I found one a few times, found one up in Pisgah, which was really exciting for me when I was teaching a summer camp. Um, that's a really good sign that that's pretty good water quality because they can't survive in poor water, water quality because hellbenders, just like all salamanders, have the ability to breathe through their skin. So they absorb oxygen through their skin. And if you absorb oxygen through your skin, you can absorb a lot of other things through your skin too, like pollution, um, which makes them very, very sensitive to all that type of water pollution and things like that. So hellbenders are very, very important. And hopefully when the nature center is back open, you will be able to see meatloaf again because he is still there and he is definitely doing well. He is a happy camper. All right, let's see. So we had, here we go. So Dan wanted to know what other local animals contribute to tick control. So we talked earlier about how opossums eat ticks. There's a lot of different 
animals that will eat a variety of insects. Um, even, I just, I keep thinking of owls because there's an owl right behind me. Um, even very, very small owls um, eat insects. So like Eastern screech owls and some other small owls eat insects and worms. Lots of songbirds eat insects as well. So there's a lot of animals that provide that wonderful service of eating ticks and all sorts of other bugs. Bugs are of course very, very important to have around, but um, if we did not have bug eaters, we would be swimming in bugs and it would be unpleasant. <laughs> all right. Let's see. Let's see if some other questions popped up on here. Ooh, can rabies infect reptiles? That's a great question. So rabies cannot infect reptiles. So rabies is a disease that affects mammals. So mammals are animals that have warm blood, they're endotherms. They have either fur or hair on their bodies, they're mammals. They produce milk and they give live birth. So mammals are animals that can get rabies. Um, reptiles cannot get rabies. Birds cannot get rabies either. It is strictly a mammal disease. However, there are plenty of other diseases that can be gotten through birds, through reptiles and things like that. Um, so we're always very careful when we're handling our birds and our reptiles, just as we are when we're handling our mammals. Anytime you've met an animal at the nature center, a lot of times we bring out reptiles for you guys to meet like snakes and turtles. And if you've ever had a physical interaction with one of those critters, so if we've ever giving you the opportunity to touch one of those animals. We always have people either use hand sanitizer or wash their hands afterwards. That is to keep them safe um, because reptiles can carry things like salmonella. So even though they're not affected by rabies, they can be affected by a lot of other diseases. That doesn't mean that they're dangerous. It just means that you have to be careful, just like you have to be careful with mammals. All right, let me see if any other questions popped up here. Oh, I missed one from Amos. So one more Amos question. Do you get many snakes? So when we did rehab, when we took in injured wildlife, we did get a lot of snakes. And sometimes they weren't snakes that were injured. They were snakes that people found in their yards. And they brought them to us either because they wanted to know what type of snake it was or they didn't want it in their yard anymore and they wanted it gone, but they didn't want to kill it. So snakes do a really important job in the wild. Um, they are nature's little pest control specialists. They eat mice, they eat rats, they eat all of those critters that we just don't want too many of. Talk about carrying diseases. Mice definitely carry some diseases. So snakes do that really important job of making sure that we don't have too many mice and rats around. Um, so if you do see a snake in your yard, we always recommend that you just leave it where it is and let it do its job because it is a very, very important job that they do. So when we, when we did rehab, we would have a decent amount of snakes come in. Sometimes they would get injured and sometimes they were just people who didn't want to have the snake in their yard. Um, but now that we don't take injured animals in, the snakes that we have have lived with us for a very, very long time. Um, so I think some of our snakes, like our rattlesnake is maybe 23 years old. Um, so we've had some of our snakes for quite a long period of time. They're one of my other favorite animals to work with. Possums and snakes have always been up there on my list of favorite critters. All right, let's see. I had another question come in. What has been the most challenging animal to work with and why? So this is, this is a little embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> I have always been very afraid of birds. Like even when I was a little kid and we had a sandbox in the backyard and a bird feeder next to it, I, I was afraid to leave the sandbox if there was a bird on the bird feeder. And I'm not talking about large birds, I'm talking about small little like songbirds too. I've just always been very uncomfortable around birds. I love birds, I think they're amazing and beautiful, I just don't like to get too close to them. So really one of the hardest animals for me to work with was our barred owl. So we had a barred owl for many, many years. His name was Artemis. I'm sure a lot of you guys remember him. He just passed away a few years ago. He was at least 20 years old. He came to us as an injured adult. Um, so he lived at the nature center for a very, very long time. He had a good long life. Um, 
But um, he did pass away. But before he did pass away, I had a few years to work with him. And I trained on, you know, putting on the glove and getting him up on glove and doing animal programs with him. And that was definitely, for me, the scariest animal to work with because I've just always been uncomfortable around birds. And birds, they're sort of like horses where they very much sense your mood and your vibe, if you will. Um, and so I would try really hard to hide that I was uncomfortable and nervous because they could tell that I was uncomfortable and nervous and then they would get like kind of worked up. So I would try to hide it. I would not always do a good job, but I was definitely always much more comfortable handling snakes, even handling like the hissing cockroaches and things like that, handling the, the mammals. So doing like skunks and possums um, than I was with birds. I, again, I love the birds. I just am never quite comfortable being too close to them. There's a really funny picture um, that one of the keepers took of me down in the barn. Um, if you guys have visited since we got our new front entrance, we have that beautiful space for the chickens. There's an indoor and an outdoor space. And I'm sitting in the indoor space um, with several of the chickens, like holding a piece of romaine lettuce. And there's like a chicken standing on my lap. And I just have the most horrified expression on my face because yes, birds do include chickens. And yes, I am afraid of chickens. Um, there's my little confessional for the day. <laughs> All right, we had another question come through. Share the most peculiar peculiar animal fact that you know of. Well, I already shared all my good possum, peculiar possum facts. Um, another animal fact that I really, really like to talk about is that frogs can freeze their bodies over winter. So frogs are just such interesting animals. Um, frogs hibernate when it gets cold outside. They are cold-blooded, they're ectotherms, just like bears will hibernate in the winter. Frogs hibernate in the winter, snakes do it, turtles do it. A lot of animals hibernate in the winter. And where it's very, very cold further up north, frogs will actually freeze their bodies. So their bodies can freeze and then they thaw again in the spring and they're perfectly fine. And they just go about their business. And I think that is just one of the most amazing things I have ever heard of. Um, is that they can completely freeze and then thaw themselves back out in the spring. They don't generally do it as much down here just because it doesn't get quite cold enough for them to, but up north there's a lot of frogs that will freeze over winter. So if you're hiking up north, be careful where you walk in the winter because you don't want to accidentally step on a frozen frog. That would not be fun for anybody. All right, let me make sure I am not missing any other questions here. I still have a few from the emails that I got earlier in the week that I can pull off of as well. Thank you guys for being so patient as we figure out our technology. Um, I have never shared a Facebook Live event with anyone before, so I've never had to find the questions and I don't know where they're all disappearing to. All right, let me pull up another one from here. So we'll do a few more questions. We'll see if I get any more texts um, with questions on them. <laughs> oh, this is an interesting one. So I had a student ask me yesterday when we were doing Q&A at the end of our distance learning session, what happens to the animals at the nature center when they die? Which is a really legitimate question. Like every animal has a lifespan and they wanted to know what we did with them once those animals passed away. So the nature center is an AZA facility, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And what that means is that we are held to very high standards for animal care, for guest care, for education, for habitat space, for enrichment, for all sorts of things. Um, we're held to very, very high standards by this facility, by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So it's something that you can apply to get certified in, and it's quite an application process. We've been going through it this year. It's time for us to re-up our application. So when you are an AZA facility, it is required that anytime an animal passes away, you send them off for a necropsy. So you send them off um, so that a vet or some other scientist can look at that animal and figure out exactly what was going on inside that animal's body, why that animal passed away. Even if we think that we already know, even if we feel confident like this is what happened, we still have to send that animal off for the necropsy. So that's what happens to all of our animals when they are no longer with us. Um, and I just thought that was a really interesting question because it's not something that people always think about, <laughs> is what are you going to do afterwards? And it's definitely something that you want to plan for. All right, let's see. I did have, I've got one more question on my um, list of email questions and I'll see if 
any other come through. And if not, then we'll just end the session in a few minutes, which is totally fine. So if you guys have more questions, please feel free to continue leaving them in the comments. I can't see them, but luckily my wonderful friend at Amos can see them and she is sending them to me. <laughs> so one more question that I have on my email list of questions. And I thought that this was one of the most interesting questions I've actually ever um, gotten before from a, from a student was, do animals laugh? And I really had to like sit and think about it for a second. Do animals laugh? Um, so of course, one of the one of the things that he was referring to when he asked that question was hyenas, because hyenas are known to laugh. And hyenas do make a laughing noise, but we wouldn't consider it like laughing in the sense that we laugh when something is funny. However, some animals do definitely appreciate humor and recognize when things are funny. Um, like your higher level primates. So I've seen some pretty amazing gorilla programs and some uh, chimpanzee programs and things like that, where you can tell that they definitely have their own version of laughing. And it's not just a noise that they're making, like they are reacting to a situation that they think is funny, which I think is just absolutely fascinating to think about um, an animal laughing essentially at a joke. Um, about having having a sense of humor and, and, and reacting to that. I think that's just one of the coolest things to think about. All right, I have not had any more questions come in um, in the comments, so we can wait just another minute. Um, but if some of you guys are ready to hang out or to head out, excuse me, um, I want to thank you very, very much for joining me. Um, I know it was <laughs> slow going at the beginning before those questions started popping in. But thank you very, very much for sending those questions and those comments to me. I love hearing about your experiences at the Nature Center and the animals that you remember, as well as all the things that you're wondering about our animals. Um, thank you very much to Amos. This is a really fun partnership that we've gotten to do and I'm hoping that we can continue the partnership in the future. Um, thank you to everyone who tuned in. I really appreciate it. If you have more questions, I'll be checking the comments later today. So if you leave them afterwards, I'll go in and I'll answer them for you guys. And then of course, you can always visit us once the Nature Center reopens. You can always visit us and ask your questions in person because once the Nature Center reopens, I am never leaving again. I'll tell you that. I am never leaving again. They're never gonna get rid of me. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much for joining me and hopefully I'll see you at the Nature Center again soon. Bye.